worship with us uh, today here on this Palm Sunday. And as the piano was playing earlier, uh, playing the song Majesty, and just what a wonderful majesty uh, our Christ is as he came into the city in a triumphal entry as he approached the days leading up to Easter. And it's hard to imagine that Easter is right upon us. But you know, on this day, they worshiped him. So I encourage you to worship wherever you are, whether that means to stand and sing out loud or to have your Bible and to really study as our pastor brings the message, uh, whatever, uh, whatever it takes, I pray that you will worship uh, today. So with that in mind, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer and just ask his blessings on this time that we have together. Father God, I just want to thank you so much for today. Uh, thank you for this day of worship, this day that uh, we have normally set aside and apart uh, to be able to focus on you. Father, these have been different days for sure. Uh, today may not feel like a whole lot different than any other day, but today is your day. Uh, today is... Uh, the day that we are able to just center in on who you are. So, Father, I pray that you'll teach us during this time that we have together. I pray that your name will be lifted high and that you will be glorified and honored. Father, I pray that um, lives will be changed because of your presence um, wherever we are meeting together. So, Father, we love you. Thank you for being the rock of our salvation. We love you. It's in your precious name that we pray. Amen. Let's worship together. Even when I fail 
for this time for us to come worship you. God, wherever the people are watching this from, their living rooms, their bedroom, or just as a, a family, God, we pray that we'll all come together and worship you. Uh, the church can be the church right now more than ever, God, helping those that are in need. Uh, God, those that are sick, those that are um, dealing with teaching at home and uh, the teachers that are out there teaching from afar and all, of, all those that are protecting us. Uh, God, all the nurses, all the doctors that are uh, working on all this going on going on. Just be with them. Give them your healing hand and your presence. Help us as we continue to worship your great and powerful name. We just now pray. Amen. Oh, 
John saw a city that could not be hid. John saw a city, oh yes he did. John caught a glimpse of the golden throne. Tell me all about it, go right on. Around the throne he saw the crystal sea. There's got to be more, what will it be? I want to go to that city he saw.
Father, it doesn't center around us what we want, what we want to see happen, but Father, it's all because of you. And Father, today as we approach Easter, Father, there's no way that we in our humanly form would want you to have to go through the death on a cross, but Father, that's your desire, that's your plan to save us, Father, to cleanse us. Thank you so much. Father, that your wisdom is so much greater than ours. Father, that you see so much more clearly than we could ever see. Father, forgive us for the times that we want to put ourselves first. But Father, I pray that, especially during this time as our pastor comes to preach, Father, that we will continue to put you first. For you to be at the very center of everything that we do. Father, we give you this time. Father, we love you, and we thank you so much. Thank you for what you did by sending your Son because you love us so much. And we love you. It's in your precious name that we pray. Amen. Amen. And good morning. Well, I wish you could be here with us. I know that it looks good, sounds good at home, but if you could just be right here, it sounds so good to be in this place with people who are worshiping and praising and celebrating. And so uh, thank you guys, all of you who've shown up today to to help us 
and you've blessed our hearts. And uh, uh, just a word of uh, catching you up. How about that? Before we look at uh, John chapter 19, uh, we want you to know that when you get back, and that'll be soon, we're going to pack the place out and we're going to do what Baptists never do. We're going to dance and we're going to sing and shout and uh, we're going to have a blast. I I'd have to tell you that I'm, I'm looking around and there are seven live speakers in this room that weren't live when all of you were here last time. And so what it sounds like in here is phenomenal. And uh, I want to say thanks to those guys who are in the balcony and in the sound system and all of that stuff they're doing. Y'all y'all just, you, you're going to be surprised when you get back. Uh, I would also tell you that we were this close not to broadcast today. And uh, for every parent who has ever said, I wish my kid would get off of a video game, don't do it. We needed one vital part uh, for us to broadcast today and uh, as of five o'clock yesterday things weren't looking so good and I want you to know uh, and I'm gonna have to call him by name because he's my grandson but uh, Brady my grandson had just the part we needed and they plugged that thing in and it's Cadillac and today and uh, who would have thought that could happen but uh, we're excited God has blessed us with that and relieved a lot of anxiety for your tech guys i can promise you that and so um hang in there with us I, I heard this past week the drive-by media said for the first time in all of these years america's not going to celebrate easter hogwash boy there was the prime illustration of fake media right fake news man we're here today on palm sunday and we're celebrating we're excited about who jesus is and what jesus has done and uh, we've been thinking about exactly what he did on the cross and how he died for us and uh, we've been looking through kind of chronologically it's not chronologically in time but it is chronologically according to the scriptures of matthew mark luke and john and the cries of Jesus Christ from the cross in each one of those Gospels. And we get to the book of John today, and we hear the greatest word of all. It's not just a word, but it is the greatest word. It is finished, finished. And that's going to be uh, powerful when we get there. But there are a couple of other cries from the cross that we find in the book of John before we get to that one. So let's read together, and uh, we'll not be able to splash some things for you today, but maybe you can see the screen even. Some of you are probably watching by your big screen television at home, and oh my, I can only imagine how I look on that, and I, many apologies. But I hope you can see all the other things that are going on. And in John chapter 19, uh, it says, Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there. And they filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on hyssop and put it to his mouth. So when he had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Father, would you add your blessing today? to the reading of this powerful, powerful Word of God. 
it is finished. And oh God, today we praise you for the finished work of Jesus Christ at Calvary. Remind us that was the work that he came to do. And he finished that work. And he accomplished the task. Oh God, we praise you today for Jesus and what he has done. And we do it in his mighty name. Amen. Well, there are two or three things that I want to just call your attention to very shortly and remind you of as we see these essentially three cries from the cross. And I remind you the first one had to do with family arrangements. Can you imagine a man hanging on a cross who is sensing and feeling and understanding the forsakenness of a father looking down and continuing to have that compassion for his mother. Can you imagine the agony and the pain that he was going through and yet as he's hanging there in all of that agony and pain, his mind and his heart are not on himself as they've never been on the cross, but they are on other people. And Jesus begins to make family arrangements for things here as you read through the scripture you see that I believe he's listing for us four women who were around the cross certainly his mother Mary was there we know that because this first cry is going to say hey mom behold your son son behold your mom and and then so Jesus is passing off his firstborn son responsibilities to his own mother and apparently by this time Joseph his earthly stepdad had passed away and so Jesus as the firstborn sons in charge of mom and making sure she's taken care of and and he delivers her into the care of someone else he's making those final arrangements before he dies and he's making sure that his mother Mary is taken care of and then it says that Mary's sister was there now I believe that to be Salome Salome the mother of James and John wait a minute if that's Mary's sister Salome and Mary sisters Jesus is Mary's son and James and John is Salome that'd make them all first cousins wouldn't it make her his aunt and I, I believe that's true I can't be dogmatic about it but Opinionology would say that's true. And so he's looking down there and he's seeing his mother. Not only that, his very special aunt, who is a sister to Mary. And then there is Mary, and we'll give her a surname. How about that? It says that she is the wife of Clopas or Cleopas. We'll just call her Mary Clopas. And that'll keep that straight for us, will it not? And then there is yet another Mary who is there at the cross, and her name is Mary Magdalene. And she is that one that Jesus has delivered and set free by his mighty power. She was the one who was demon-possessed, and he set her free, and forever Mary Magdalene followed the Lord Jesus Christ and praised him for having been set free and saved. From that demonic oppression now Jesus is looking out there and what does he see all of those 12 apostles those disciples that have been so faithful and and wonderful to him right not only one of them John stands there the lone man that is listed for us among these four women as Jesus hangs there and looks upon those. Now, Jesus then is left with this task. Here is his mother. He is the firstborn son, is about to die. That means next brother should take over, right? But listen, he has no spiritual brothers at home. Those guys have not come to faith. They didn't believe at this, to- this point. In Jesus, they didn't believe that Jesus says he uh, didn't believe that he is who he says he is, you know, the Messiah. They, they were unbelievers. But John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was standing there. 
And so, as his cousin perhaps, Jesus looks at John and he says, there is a man of faith. There is a man who knows who I am and what I've taught. There is a man who will love my mother far more than any physical brother could. But deeper and longer and harder, he will love her as my spiritual brother. And so he assigns that task to John. And it says from that moment on, John took his task seriously. From that moment, she went to his home and lived with him. Now, what does that say to us today? Uh, just a simple statement. Faith and faith family is stronger than earthly family. When the earthly family has no faith. Wow. What's more important? Family or faith? Faith. The neat thing is that when we come to know Jesus Christ, we all become brothers and sisters together in that faith family. And so we have a new family. Jesus is looking at John and saying, there's a new family arrangement here, guys. John, you take my mom and you take care of her. Mom, you go with John. Why? Because you both know who I am. You both have expressed faith. You understand the realities. And so now there's a new family relationship. Boy, one of the things that's hurting so bad right now at Briar Hill Baptist Church and every other church around is the fact that we as brothers and sisters can't get together. Well, that just hurts, doesn't it? And... Uh, it's going to be great when we can. And I know there are a lot of folks sitting at home. Maybe there's a tear dropping at home because they can't be here with us. We're all smiles and giggly and happy because we're here. Amen. But uh, there are probably some at home who are just wishing, wishing. And there's some grief going on back there. And uh, families are hurting. And families need encouragement. And they don't necessarily need it from earthly families. They need it from their faith family. And I prayed with uh, David Allen this morning. And uh, he, he lost his earthly mom last night. She passed away up in Louisville. And uh, all of you know David. David Allen is, is a pastor and uh, makes this his home church and, and works out uh, from the base here at Briar Hill. I prayed with him this morning, and, and we cried together on the phone. Why? Because he lost an earthly mom. But then he made this statement. Oh, but she was a good woman, and she was full of faith, and she knew Jesus. Wow. That's far more important. But listen, that's what we ought to be doing right now, talking to each other, calling one another sending letters and cards and, and just trying to stay in touch as much as we can. Why? Because this faith family is far stronger than any other family that we have. The good stuff is when our earthly family is a family of faith as well. And that's the best of all worlds. Amen. But Jesus sent his mother home with John because he knew it would be difficult for Mary to go home to a room full of unbelievers. Can you imagine what would have happened had she gone back to that house? She, she'd had to have sit in the kitchen or uh, cook or, or, or be busy about, and she'd have to have heard it in, in, the, in the ear. Ah, oh, Jesus shouldn't have done that. I don't know what he was thinking. I don't know if he went off his rocker, he went crazy. I think he lost his mind. Man, for him to have put our poor mama through what he put her through. All of those kinds of things. That would have been unbelieving talk that Mary would have had to suffer through had she gone home. On top of the grief of having lost her son. Oh, but she goes home with John and she's sitting around with John and they're saying, Hey, you remember that time? 
<laughs> you remember that place? You remember when he cast the demons out of Mary Magdalene? And man, they feel good. And they're encouraged. And they're strengthened. Why? Because that love is centered in the Lord Jesus Christ. But not only were the, was, was there a new family re- arrangement made, but there's also scriptural fulfillment found in this passage. You see, as it, it continues, Jesus says in verse 28, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things now were accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now, who in the world would have thought Jesus Christ hanging on the cross, and he says, I thirst. Who would have thought that that was a necessity for him to say? Oh, people just picking it up and reading it would say, yeah, he's been hanging on the cross all these hours. And by the way, John just simply passes over about three hours of darkness and in silence. But he gets to this end and he says, I thirst. Anybody else reading this would think, oh yeah, he's, he's bled out. He's dehydrated. He is struggling for breath. His tongue is thick in his mouth and he needs to speak. And so you need something to wet your whistle. Just a little bit of drink there. Something to quench his thirst. But there's more to it than that. A lot more to it. And don't confuse this sour wine with the wine and myrrh that was offered to him before he ever got there. You remember that? They offer him uh, a sedative, really, before the crucifixion event really gets going. And he refuses. He didn't want that. But he takes this sour wine. It's different. It, it was a, a cheap spolioli wine that the soldiers had drank around you know just kind of, kind of ruined kind of stuff um, cheap 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 and there's a big vessel of it sitting there so it was for consumption and so Jesus says I thirst and they put some in a sponge and, and give it to him and when he had received it I think it's, it's you've ever been to the hospital sometime folks couldn't take anything with ice chips maybe or a little something and they give them those little sticks with a sponge on it that are moist and oh boy it feels so good when you run that thing in your mouth and you get just a little bit of moisture that's all this was just enough moisture for him to cry the greatest cry before we're done today but Before we get to that one, you've got to understand this was more than just thirst. I want to read it again now, and let me emphasize some words. After this, Jesus, knowing all things were now accomplished, that the Scripture might be fulfilled, said. That the Scripture might be fulfilled, said. And you go back and think about it. He's been hanging on the cross. Uh, Psalm 22 is definitely on his mind he himself has quoted from psalm 22 in the very first verse when he cried out my god my god why have you forsaken me psalm 22 in verse 8 uh, records how they would come by the cross and they would wag their heads and they would say ah he delivered others let him now let's see if he can deliver himself and then in verse 16 it talks about him having been pierced in psalm 22 and then in psalm 22 and verse 18 it talks about the roman soldiers really gambling for his garments jesus is fulfilling all of that scripture in psalm 22 soldiers are fulfilling that scripture even these little crooked crowd people who are walking by and wagging their heads and saying deliver yourself are literally quoting from scripture unbeknownst to them in psalm 22 and so to this point the scripture has played an important part in what's going on on the cross why so that we might know the one hanging on the cross was indeed the one who should come that he indeed is the messiah that he indeed is the one son of god and there is no other 
And so apparently there is still yet a lack. There are still some things from Scripture that Jesus knows because he wrote Scripture. By his Holy Spirit, he wrote that Scripture. Jesus knows are yet to be fulfilled. Even in this delirium of the cross, the death of the cross, the dying of the body, Jesus is concerned with the holy writ of God, the Bible. Now, where would we find, though, any reference to this thirst? Well, you'd have to understand this is a fulfillment of Psalm 69. And if you would look in Psalm 69 and verse 21, you'll see the second half of that verse says, For my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Jesus is making sure every detail, every single detail of the Old Testament is fulfilled. He's making sure that everything is done and accomplished. And he says, now it is fulfilled. The scripture is finished and completed. The prophecies have been brought to pass. It's all done. We've not left anything out, he says by that simple statement of thirst. There is this request that he makes. And by the way, Psalm 69 begins in verse one with these exclamations. Save me, O God. Those are the very first words of Psalm 69. And several verses long. Who would have ever read Psalm 69 and thought that it would be a prophecy about Jesus Christ? And yet the Holy Spirit reveals that to us, confirming who Jesus is. Jesus makes that request because it was needful. And the soldier responds in order to fulfill Scripture. They gave me vinegar to drink. Well, what does that say to us? that the Word of God is important. Just as surely as, as this new family arrangement shows us that faith in God is of paramount importance in this world, so too this statement reminds us that the Word of God is vital to us. But quickly, let me go to that third and greatest statement. One word is left. And it is a word of power, strength, and glory. It is the word finished. It is a finished transaction. Now, we read it as, as uh, three words. In verse 30, when he had received that sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and he gave up his ghost. He says, into the hands of Father, I commit my spirit, and he died. But listen, this final word from John, it is finished. Three words in the English, one word in the Greek. Y'all are familiar with that word from time to time because we who play with Greek a little bit like to say tetelestai. Y'all heard that word before? Just one real big word. What was that word? Well, let's say that you had a servant, a slave. And you call that servant to yourself and you said, hey, I need you to go over and do some task for me. And you gave them instruction. They went, they accomplished their task, and they would come back to you as boss or slave. And they would say, Tetelestai, I finished the work you gave me. It's done. It's finished. Or or maybe a farmer who is out inspecting his herd finds a a brand new uh, little lamb or in his flock and he's looking and he's looking and and boy it's just perfect it is the ideal specimen of a lamb and he would look at it and go whoa to tell us that that's good it's perfect it's complete it's whole it's just as it should be or, or maybe a priest is going to take that little lamb that very lamb that the farmer has brought and And that priest is looking at that little lamb in order to be a sacrifice. And they're going to offer that lamb. And he would examine that lamb. And 
when they would declare that lamb fit to be the sacrifice to tell us die. It would say all that needed to be said. You know, have, have you ever painted a painting and you just keep playing with it and playing with it and playing with it and then you finally mess it up because you did too much? The great artists of the world are able to paint a beautiful picture or make a, a wonderful sculpture and stand back and know that it's complete. There's nothing more needs to be added. And he would say, to tell us time. It's done. It's finished. It looks good. Or this is probably the one that you've heard most often. Let's say that I go down to the store and we make a deal. And I like what I bought and you like the price I pay we shake on it good deal it's a good deal if both parties in a deal as a, in, a, in a merchant transaction are happy and satisfied it's a good deal to tell us that it's a good deal some are going to go so far as to say here's what that word means and we don't have a lot of extra biblical evidence for this but it is always always said and we used to have a, a, a young group that played out of a church, former church I was at. Their, their name was paid in full. And you've heard that's what that word means. Paid in full. And indeed, that's what Jesus Christ was doing as he hung there on the cross. It is the idea of fulfilling your religious obligations. Jesus said, I've come into this world to finish the work that you've done, you, you've called for me to do. He says that all the way back over in John chapter 4. Then you get over into John chapter 17 in verse 4 in the high priestly prayer. Jesus is praying for himself to the Father. And he said, I have finished the work that you sent me here to do. I have finished the work which you've given me to do. Same word. Back over in chapter 17 verse 4 when he's telling the Father, I've done it. Now he is letting us know that the work of redemption is accomplished. That's a word of redemption. You see, Jesus came into this world to pay a debt that he did not owe. For you and me who owed a debt, we could not pay. We owe a debt. It is a sin debt. And what happens when you and I as a sinner have no way to pay the debt before an offended God, what happens is that we spend an eternity separated from God because it is a debt we owe that we cannot pay. We never get, it's kind of like having a Discover card. I don't care how much you pay. It, you just can't get her done. You pay the minimum, you'd be paying on that thing when you die. That's like hell. <laughs> only worse you owe a debt you can't pay and you pay on those installment plans and it just keeps on going and going and going forever because you cannot finish the debt you cannot pay it in full because our sin has offended an infinitely righteous God and so Jesus comes to pay our debt for us and that's why he becomes the sin bearer. He's our sin bearer. He who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He bore our sins in his flesh on the cross. Whatever that means, I'm, I'm glad he did it. Thank you, Jesus, that you are our sin bearer. And we can certainly say that he is our sin sacrifice. When he hung on the cross, he was sacrificing his life. He didn't have to. And so when he dies, he didn't have his life taken from him. He gave up his spirit. He gave his life. Why? Because he is our sin, sacrifice. He willingly paid our debt. Now, he paid the debt for all who will accept it. You know, you've you got to accept it or reject it. 
Man, I have been a fool in my life at times, and sometimes I've been a big fool. I remember pastoring at Tula Baptist Church early in my ministry, and we had a lady who uh, had attended Blue Mountain College and loved Blue Mountain College with all her heart, and God had blessed her. She was a wealthy lady. And she came to me one day and said, if I paid for your tuition, all your books and all that good stuff, could you go to Blue Mountain College? Oh, Miss Juanita, I don't know about that. No stiff-necked, cold-hearted, stupid Malcolm. I didn't take her up on it. Wow. God let me pay on that bill till I was pastor of Mantee Baptist Church. And one day somebody came up and said, Hey, is there something I could do for my pastor? That man, you could throw $100 on my, my school loan. And in just a few weeks, I got a letter. I still owed like seven grand. I got a letter in the mail, and there it was, paid in full. Now listen, you can say, no, I don't want it. And you can bear the payment of your sin. Well, I'm going to tell you, you'll never get it paid off. And you'll spend an eternity in hell, separated from God Almighty, the giver of life, if you say no to the debt payment of Jesus. There has to be a time when you say, yes, Jesus, I can't pay this debt, and it'd be great for you to pay it for me. I accept that free gift. And he loves you. Miss Juanita loved me and wanted to give to me, but I refused. Oh, how I hate that. I robbed her of such a blessing. It would have blessed her, and it would have blessed me, and we wouldn't have had a debt for so many years. But it blessed another man one day when I said yes. And he paid my debt off, and I'm thankful. But the greater the greater debt that I owed was the sin debt. And Jesus Christ one day said, Malcolm, you received me, and you let me pay this debt, I'll give you eternal life. I'm so glad I said yes. I said yes on a Thursday night in a week at a revival service. I first made a step toward Jesus. And he forgave me, cleansed me, saved me. Later, kneeling across an old stick of pulpwood out in the middle of the woods. We were doing business. I went to my knees on a pulpwood stick, and I said, God, something ain't right. And I prayed to God at that point, and I said, if I am saved, take this feeling of conviction and all this away from me. If not, please save me just now. When I stood up, it was as Jesus had said, paid in full. And I knew it. Wherever you may be, you're not able to come here today, are you? <laughs> you could be out in the middle of the woods, on your knees, laying across a stick of pulpwood. But if you mean business with God, God will finish that business and God will pay your sin debt through Jesus Christ. If you confess that you owe the debt, yeah, I do. I'm a sinner. God, I have a debt, but I can't pay it. Plead for mercy, plead for forgiveness, and through Jesus Christ, your debt can be forgiven. It's finished. I think the greatest word spoken by the greatest man that ever lived on the greatest day that ever was, it's finished. If you come to faith in Jesus, please come today. Confess that you have a sin debt and that you're a sinner and you're lost without Jesus Christ. Receive the free gift 
of redemption through Jesus Christ and his blood that pays that debt. Listen, the death on the cross is not defeat. So many unbelievers and so many infidels through the years have claimed that this word, it's finished, should have been, I'm finished. That's not what it is. It's not a cry of defeat. It is a cry of victory. The victory is found in Jesus Christ and Christ alone. You come to him now. After this time, we're going to have people manning phones, and you'll be able to call us at 601-845-6843. Somebody will be there to answer the phone and to pray with you. If you'd like to give your heart to Jesus, we could do that over the phone. We can do it right now. As God speaks to your heart now, right where you are, pray a prayer like, God, I'm a sinner. I'm lost, and I need Jesus. I accept the free gift of eternal life. I thank you that he's paid my sin debt. Thank you for saving me. Pray a prayer like that. You mean business with God. God will mean business with you. I promise. Let's pray. Father, help us as we move into a time of decision. People here and people at home and people that will see and hear this message in the days to come. God, what we ask just now is that you will deal with their hearts, convict them of their sin, save them from their lost condition, and give them eternal life through Jesus Christ the Son of God who paid our sin debt on the cross. And we ask it in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.